Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning right after the weekend. Hope you all had a good uh, weekend. And uh, here we are today uh, to discuss this important uh, EU proposal. It's not a new proposal because, as most of you are aware, there is a directive that is currently in place. But the Commission is proposing now a regulation which updates and uh, brings changes to the current regime. So uh, we thought it would be important also, given the level of interest it created uh, nationally over the past weeks, to have a broader discussion, first of all, to create awareness and to provide more detail about the pro proposal itself, but also to hear from you um, your questions, your comments vis-a-vis uh, -vis this proposal, which we will have the time to uh, discuss in more in more detail throughout this morning's event, which we'll try to keep to one hour. So I'll try to be short because we have a long list of speakers as well as the presentation, and we want to allow time for for engagement with our audience. So um, what we'll do first is I'll invite uh, the president of the Mata Business Bureau, Ms. Alison Mitzi, to give some introductory remarks. And then I will come back in again where I will give a presentation, uh, a detailed presentation with all the provisions of the uh, regulation as it stands right now, after which then we have a, a list of guest speakers to share their views with us. So let's start with uh, the introductory remarks by the president of the Mata Business Bureau. Hi, good morning and good morning everyone and thank you for making the time to join us for this webinar to discuss this um, new regulation that Daniel has just introduced. I ju I just a general brief introduction about what MBB is if you're just meeting us for the first time. Um, the Malta Business Bureau is the organization that represents the Malta Chamber and the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association in Brussels and Malta on EU matters. It aims to, one, inform the Maltese business community about EU policy and legislative developments, whilst also gathering opinions from your end to convey to our representative at an EU level, including the Maltese government, MEPs, the European Economic and Social Committee, as well as our wider network of business organisations at an EU level. Now, shifting to the day's focus, the topic of today, um, everybody, I assume, agrees that reliable payment streams are key to a competitive economy, particularly for SMEs, and that deferred or late payments affect business across all sectors, with SMEs bearing a, dis a disproportionate burden. Each year, across Europe, many companies go bankrupt, and on-time payments could at times prevent this from happening. As a result, jobs are lost and entrepreneurship is stiffened. Late payments cause administrative and financial burdens, which are particularly acute when business is done across different EU countries. Cross-border trade is inevitably impacted. The European Commission considers that the underlying cause of late payments lies in the unequal bargaining power that there is between larger clients and smaller suppliers, often forcing the latter to accept unfair payment terms. Some, in fact, some abusive businesses may also find late payments as an attractive form of free financing, while creditors bear the associated costs. The Commission believes that the current late payment directive that is currently in force has a number of shortcomings as it lacks adequate preventive measures, deterrence, enforcement mechanisms and redress options. This is why, towards the end of the year, it has proposed a late payment regulation, which aims to improve payment discipline amongst all involved parties, including public authorities and companies of all sizes. Now, during today's discussion, we will understand in more detail what the proposal entails and whether it is fit for purpose. We will ask, could there be other preventive measures than the ones proposed by the Commission that could help to improve the on-payment culture? Does the proposal help or work against the interest of SMEs? Should the EU undermine freedom of contract between two private organisations undergoing private commercial transaction? Should there be stricter terms applicable to public authorities to lead by example in executing prompt payment? On that note, I hope that you find this information session interesting. 
and I do encourage you to share your thoughts and views with us as this will feed in our advocacy we work that we do and um, where we convey our um, the sentiment of the Maltese businesses to stakeholders at a new level and also our representatives who are negotiating this legislation in the EU Council and Parliament that is currently ongoing. Thank you, Daniel. I will pass this on to you now again. You're muted. Daniel, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I think. Sorry, I was on mute. I, I was just thanking you, Ms. Mitzi, for the introductory remarks, which uh, explained the motivations of the European Commission, why it has uh, revised the current directive and um, also raised some important questions um, which we would like to put forward also to our speakers uh, later on in, in this event. So what um, I propose that we do next to move on with uh, today's uh, webinar is to go through the actual reg regulation whereby I will explain uh, a little bit in more detail uh, what it talks about. Uh, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned, Ms. Mitzi, we're still in the process of negotiations at EU level, so this is not what will be implemented, but it's what's on the table so far. So uh, the European Parliament are currently negotiating their position, the EU Council is negotiating its position, eventually they will have to negotiate together for a final outcome. But I think it's important that at this stage we have this discussion because we would like to hear from the stakeholders and from companies uh, their views to be able to feed that information uh, in Brussels to the legislators. So I will uh, quickly go through the, um, uh, the presentation. Uh, as just a very quick uh, roundup, uh, the, the, the presentation, excuse, excuse me, the, 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 the regulation was published in September 2023 as part of the SME package. Um, as was mentioned in the introductory remarks, it has to do or it aims to achieve, uh, let's say, better competitiveness uh, in the EU economy and for SMEs through rel reliable payment streams. Uh, the Commission, the Commission's assessment of the reasons why it came up with this uh, revision is that larger enterprises may be abusing uh, their position or their leverage with sm smaller suppliers and providing unfair payment terms and conditions. And in the broader EU agenda uh, sphere, this proposal fits within the SME strategy and also the communication for long-term competitiveness of the EU. Now let's delve into the regulation. I think uh, First of all, it's important to state that this regulation will apply to all commercial transactions that are undertaken between businesses and also uh, between a government and the business for um, public procurement, uh, works and services. There are some exemptions uh, from the regulation that will apply in cases of B2C, so it does not apply to business to consumer. Also in cases of compensation for damages from insurance companies, for instance, in that case, it could take uh, longer terms than the one prescribed under this regulation, and also in relation to payments resulting from obligations to insolvency proceedings. Other than these three exceptions, all transactions fall within scope of this regulation. And the most important provision, which you may have already heard of because it, it created quite some noise in the media locally already, uh, the Commission is essentially proposing that any payment must be made within 30 days that uh, two companies are not able to agree to longer payment terms beyond this 30 day period. This differs from the current directive, which uh, unless I'm incorrect and perhaps yourself can correct me later on, it's the de facto period is 60 days, but it provides the flexibility for companies to agree to longer payment periods, which now will no longer be the case. Um, there is another added provision in the case of public procurement, whereby the contracting authority uh, will require from the contractor proof that their subcontractors have been paid within the 30 days. So this is, uh, you could call it a uh, another layer of uh, administrative requirement, which would be um, required by contractors to the contracting authority. Interest on late payments. So. 
this is already the case as well in the current directive, uh, but it is reinstated now also with the uh, level of interest rate, which uh, is being set at 8% over and above the ECB reference rate. I've seen some reports in the media that as things are today, for example, if, if there were, had to be a late payment this month, the level of interest rate would be of 12.5% because it's 8% plus the reference rate of the ECB. That will obviously shift according to what the ECB reference rate is, but the 8% is, is fixed. Fixed. The interest rate would be automatically due once uh, there is a late payment and the creditor cannot waive their right from collecting the late payment. Um, also, I think this is quite obvious, but it's being said just uh, to be clear, uh, whenever there is a payment that is agreed to be to be made on different schedules, in case there is a late payment, the interest rate would apply to that part of the schedule, not on the entire value of the of the payment, of course. Then there is also the compensation for recovery costs. So this is also something which already exists in the current directive, which increases marginally from 40 to 50 euro. It also applies automatically once there is a late payment and also uh, the creditor does not have the right to waive uh, this, com this compensation from being applied. So it needs to be applied automatically. This is a minimum fee that would apply if the creditor can justify uh, that there have been ad additional costs to uh, recover their payments, they could also increase uh, from this 50 euro, which is the minimum fixed fee. There are certain conditions which are not possible to include to be included in uh, contractual terms between companies. They essentially reflect what I have said so far. So, for example, but in case, for example, two companies are not aware of the late payments regulation and between themselves, they would include in the contract that uh, they agree to a longer payment than 30 days. In the eyes of the law, that would be considered null and void. The same would go if there is any conditions that would limit the creditor's right to collect interest uh, on late payment and the compensation for recovery costs that would be null and void, and also any conditions that would extend the duration for the procedure of verification that would go beyond 30 days, because once goods are received, they must be verified uh, at least within 30 days of them being received. On the other hand, there is a possibility for a clause as an opt-in, the retention of title. So this is not automatic, but two parties can agree that the creditor could retain the title of the goods until they are actually fully paid. Now, let's uh, discuss the role of the enforcement authority. So the, um, the proposal requires that the member states establish an enforcement authority. I have to say it's not clear to me whether this needs to be a new entity or whether the powers can be passed on to an existing entity. Perhaps, Brian, a question that I make to you as of now already, which you could answer in your intervention later to clarify this. However, the, the enforcement authority in whichever form it is will have certain powers to initiate and conduct investigations uh, to ensure that companies are complying with this regulation, either out of their own uh, initiative or as a result of a complaint by companies, of course. They could carry out uh, on-site inspections and will require that the companies, both creditors and debtors, debtors to provide them with all relevant documentation. And the competent uh, enforcement authority will also have the power to impose or initiate proceedings that result in penalties for not complying with the regulation. It will be up to the member states to decide what the level of penalties will be. Then, um, and this is the final slide, so it's it's quite a quick presentation before we delve into the, the reactions by our guest speakers. Um, the, the Commission um, encourages that the member states provide uh, more alternative dispute resolution uh, opportunities and mechanisms. There is, in fact, a separate EU package on uh, alternative dispute resolutions, which is not uh, the topic of today, but this is obviously an effective, a more effective uh, and cheaper means of uh, resolving disputes. So it's seen as one way to avoid uh, court proceedings. And apart from that, the member states will also be required to ensure that particular SMEs have access to credit management tools and financial literacy trainings to avoid being caught up in situation of late payments. 
Finally, once the negotiations are concluded and the legislation is adopted at EU level, there will be a 12, 12 month transitory period before the regulation will come into force. So that brings the end uh, to this presentation. I'm sure some of you might already have comments or questions, but we will come to that very shortly. You could uh, do that by already start sending your questions or comments in the in the chat uh, that is available to everyone, everyone. But if you would like to make a, a comment, um, you could raise your hand and my colleague Gabriel will give you access to the camera and to the um, microphone. So, but before we get to that, I would like to first uh, move on to the next phase of uh, our um, session today by inviting some uh, of the stakeholders that have spoken up. In fact, already we've seen in the media several articles and interviews uh, that they have uh, given. And after that, we have also invited a official from the Ministry of the Economy to share with us the government's point of view on uh, this proposal and also perhaps an idea of how it is um, moving at EU level in the EU Council. But we'll come to Brian uh, later on in the session. So first of all, I would like to invite Nick Schwirep, who is the Deputy President of the Malta Chamber. Uh, Nick is also a representative of uh, the company Tolly Products, so a, a direct uh, let's say, could be impacted directly by this uh, regulation, who can also speak from the perspective of a company. Uh, Nick, I, I give you the floor to share with us your views of the Malta Chamber, but also your personal experience as an operator in the market. OK, thank you, uh, Daniel. So good morning, everyone. First of all, let me start by thanking the Malta Business Bureau for organizing this uh, webinar on, uh, I think, a very important topic. Today's discussion resonates with businesses of all sizes across the European, European Union, not least in, in Malta. Although we agree on a robust and fair system that supports the interest of creditors, there are certain rigid mandatory aspects proposed in this regulation with which, as Malta Chamber, we do not agree. Two key questions which cropped up in my mind as soon as we embarked on our members outreach were one, why did the EU opt for a regulation rather than a directive to regulate late payments? And secondly, why did the EU advocate for a tighter one size fits all, um, uh, as it tends to do more recently, I would say, as a legal tool instead of allowing less tighter practices at member states level to reflect differing financing cultures among them? Late payments do cause cash flow problems, leading to bankruptcies, recurrent costly admin administration inputs, loss of jobs and financial uncertainties to businesses, um, especially SMEs, which certainly bear a high degree of discouragement for entrepreneurs to invest. Therefore, the question is whether this regulation achieves these objectives, which I think is the most important thing. Will cross-border standard payment terms for commercial transactions be truly streamlined and efficient in their execution, reducing incidents of bankruptcies, loss of jobs and discouragement for investment. As the Malta Chamber, we believe that a further in-depth analysis is required to understand how effectively and efficiently this regulation will simplify the way how to address the many instances of late payments. There's no doubt that we stand against anything which comes in the way of better liquidity and a healthier cash flow. I think all businesses will definitely uh, agree to that. We need to ascertain ourselves that automatic payment of interest and compensation fees for late payment defaulters would in practice truly protect the interest of creditors. We agree to a stronger level of enforcement and redress to, to safeguard creditors against bad payers. No doubt about that. This rightly includes public authorities as well. Yet again, we do not blame those who still express scepticism on how the authorities will be monitoring and taking action in practice. As I said, being the National Chamber of Commerce in Malta, we have worked hand in hand with the Malta Business Bureau to reach out directly to our members, decipher what they had to say and provide our feedback. This topic, not surprisingly, attracted one of the highest feedback response rates we've received, reflecting a number of different perspectives, mostly coming from the members of our importers, distributors and retailers economic group, which is one of three the three economic groups within the chamber. Let me share a few of these. 
So why is many of the uh, um, uh, members support the initiative to improve payment discipline, recognizing its positive impact on all parties involved? Most of our members told us that a clear distinction should be drawn between late payment and the necessary long payment terms, two different things, especially for companies operating with low margins or cash flow depends on the selling of supplied goods. Any rigidity in the regulation on this matter is not seen well. Secondly, if we truly believe that longer payment terms can act as a source of financing for SMEs facing limited access to bank loans, then we have an issue with the freedom of contract between business as proposed in the regulation. The freedom of contract only applies, as Daniel was sharing with us just a few minutes ago, when parties negotiate payment terms which do not exceed 30 days, which in practice we know is, 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 is going to be hugely impractical. In a country where we import over 70% of what we consume, we will frequently find ourselves as the buyers. Most of our members have long-standing business relationships with suppliers overseas, requesting credit term extensions when certain circumstances occur. With the wording in the regulation, this leeway will definitely be impaired. Thirdly, late payment terms, late payments sorry, also tend to increase uh, during times of crisis and economic turmoil. The inability to meet overhead and operating costs by most small, possibly medium companies as well as the circumstances, which needs to be acknowledged. We therefore caution for proper proportionality in such circumstances. Therefore, we need to keep following this issue to, to understand how the enforcement bodies and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms will address non-compliance without unnecessary administrative burden. Fourthly, while payment delays have a significant impact on businesses' liquidity and cash flow, the need to teach how to deploy good credit management practices to secure better cash flow and always maintain good customer relationship should be given much importance. I can say this from, from, from personal experience um, where I'm directly involved in the company I'm, I'm involved in. This is a really important um, thing that needs to take place. Here for sure, our colleagues from MACM would be able to contribute significantly. If I can add a personal perspective from experiences I have with selling outside of the EU, I have a question. Has the regulation considered the impact on competitiveness when EU businesses are selling to non-EU businesses who will probably not be playing with the same rules? So you, so you need to maintain payment terms of 30 days with your suppliers in the, in, in, within the EU but those outside the EU, US, Asia, etc., might not have those so payment, the same payment terms and put those companies in a, in, a, in a disadvantaged position. So, ladies and gentlemen, the regulation is more of a sweet and sour pill, which requires us all to work closer together to make it better. We need to ensure that this regulation effectively supports the different needs of businesses in Malta, not jo just those on mainland EU. Whilst thanking MBB for their valuable work, I look forward to further insights from the num from the various speakers we have during this session. Over to you, Daniel, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick Schwirep, uh, on behalf of the Malta Chamber for that comprehensive overview and um, feedback that, that you have provided. Um, we have already received a comment uh, from David Kutayar, who I think shared more or less your views uh, with respect to the need to maintain the uh, the flexibility for uh, the freedom of contracts. I think it's it's from what we've heard also generally it's a broader it's a broader um, shared view that needs to be co continued harpened on with with the EU institutions. So we'll move now to uh, Tony Ocini, who. Uh, is an operations executive at the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association, the uh, second parent organization of the Malta Business Bureau together with the Malta Chamber. So we would, would also would like to understand how the hospitality sector is, is viewing this, this proposal. Tonio. Good morning. Good morning, Daniel and everybody. Thank you for this uh, quite informative session. Um, uh, thank you for uh, all our members who also has managed to join us this morning. Um, I'm quite a disadvantage after Nick comprehensive details that he <laughs> went through and uh, enlightened uh, because these are things that, you know, business is similar to each other, although, you know, hospitality, we have hotels and restaurants, but 
everybody works together and uh, so basically i will not divulge into repeating what uh, nick have said otherwise we we, we keep on uh, repeating the same thing but for sure a one size fits all is out of the question you know that is for sure and i'm happy that even chamber are in agreement this with this way and even through their members they have that feedback because that is the same thing that we have received from our members as also through the survey that mbb have carried out uh, before coming out to the um, uh, our position paper that we have presented uh, together uh, to the for us within the eu um an important point is also why uh, it has opted as as nick said why it is a regulation, not a directive. And this makes it more difficult for us to, to take it in, you know, because this is something that will kill competitiveness, will kill cash flow, and will kill SMEs who don't have so much cash flow into their banks, you know, to, to comply within a 30 day um, uh, payment terms. So this is something that we have to look into. Um, uh, there is also administrative burdens we have you understand that the larger hotels who have a structure of human resources can comply in a way or another but smaller hotels this is creates more more pressure on them there is more administrative thing to chase every invoice see that you are within the 13 day, 13 days payment and so it will strain more on business we we'll strain more on business relationships so we will create more issues court court uh, sessions you know because it, there will be for sure it, it's not practical in two days that within 30 days you have to pay everything within those restrictive timelines so there will be as i even next said a competitive disadvantages even within our sectors even within our local uh, industries let alone with other competitive uh, sectors coming from non-EU countries. So this is something that we have look, to look into these things. Um, uh, we have to put up our, our foot down and reach out to an alternative agreement. An alternative agreement should be that we have to leave, let the, the, the business work together. They have to work and agree on a term, payment terms. We agree that there should be some regulations that or some type of control on, you know, because you cannot work with others money. So th this is something that we have to look into and see how we can um, support the suppliers in a way or another. So they have they get paid. But once a supplier and the receiver is 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 in agreement with the payment terms, I don't think that we should go into that and kill this type of collaboration between the supplier and the seller you know and uh, and the buyer sorry so these are things that for sure i'm going through my points which nick uh, most of them have already uh, listed i started to tick them off <laughs> while he was mentioning the points so i i hope that i did not leave any point uh, out and even the implementation of cost to do this thing because as I said, uh, smaller uh, SMEs or restaurants will surely affect by uh, implementation costs because they will have to engage someone within the structures to implement and monitor all these invoices. Um, uh, so these are things that we are looking at um, and stability in this type of, of compliance within the regulation. So another point is the enforcement. We have to understand how the enforcement is going to act because the, the thing that someone just pops into your business, you know, this is something that we have to understand how it's going to work because we already have some restrictions between returns and everything. So I think that we have to look into these details and understand better the repercussions uh, on the businesses on those lines. So I thank you for that. I thank MBB for this presentation and uh, we, we look forward to other comments from our participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tonio Cini, for um, the perspectives of the hospitality sector from MHRA. Uh, I will now move to Josef Buzitil. 
So, Yosef, uh, we've we've heard so far from the representatives of the of businesses broadly speaking, but you are in the thick of it. You're in, in you know in the t credit management business, so um, your views are are obviously um, welcome, and and we're uh, looking forward to hear what you have to say. But also, um, I would like to take the opportunity before before I give you the floor because we have a question, and perhaps you might be able to answer it as well. Um, so we, we received a question from, uh, there isn't a name, but it says MC Consult, so I guess from an advisory firm, and it says what happens in a situation where there is a non-formal claim that is raised with the creditor with regard to a service provided on the amount being charged. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, the question is whether there is a dispute, uh, what happens with, with regards to the payment terms in this regard, uh, if, if I'm understanding correctly. The second question is what would happen to late payments on invoices that were issued prior to the entry in the force of the regulation? That I think I can answer because the regulation would apply uh, to those invoices that are presented after its application. So um, invoices presented prior to the application of the regulation will continue following the rules uh, under the current directive, whilst invoices presented after the regulation comes into force will have to follow the new rules. So uh, I, I continue to invite other uh, participants to send their uh, comments in, in, in the chat. And uh, in, in the meantime, I will pass on the floor to Josef Buzotti. Yes, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, thank you for the invitation. MBB is doing a sterling job. Uh, well done. Uh, let's keep working together because this is a very important uh, issue for the business community, not only in Malta, but uh, uh, in, in the European Union. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to, um, I'd like to define what we are talking about. We're talking about protecting SMEs, no? And the definition for SMEs is to employing 250 people. And this business should have a turnover of uh, up to 50 million. So what are we saying here? We're saying that here in Malta, approximately 98% of businesses by definition, are SMEs. Obviously, in, in, in the European Union, it is also uh, SMEs represent um, uh, a high percentage uh, of, of the business community. So uh, we have to, to uh, put this into, into uh, the perspective. Why are, uh, am, I, am, I saying, uh, am I saying this? Because Creditors and buyers may be SMEs themselves. So a buyer can be an SME, and probably the buyer is an SME. So who are we protecting with this regulation, with this suggested regulation? Um, both Daniels and both Nick and, and Tonio's presentation were music to my ears. Uh, we all agree about um, about having uh, a situation where there is no late payments. Obviously, nobody wants uh, to to lend or to to grant credit to a customer, and this customer pays late. Granted, however, we are missing a point. Not we, but <laughs> who is suggesting the, the, this regulation is missing a point. Because I can agree with Tonio, for example, being in the catering industry, a 60 day terms. And we have agreed with 60 days terms, those are our credit terms. Late payment is when Tonio Cini exceeds those 60 days. So late payments start from the 61st day onwards. So let's make a difference between credit terms and late payments. They are not one and the same thing. We as MACM, obviously, we are there. We have been there for 23 years now, trying to improve this late payment 
problem. Nobody wants late payments. We are here to provide uh, data, to provide services, to provide for suppliers so that they will grant credit profitably without possible late payments. We know there is a problem with late payments, not only in Malta, but all over Europe. Um, I'm also on the board of FECMA. FECMA is the Federation of European Credit Management Associations, and we discuss these issues all the time. I am also lecturing all over, all over uh, internationally, not, 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 only, not only in Malta, but um, everywhere in the world. And there is a problem of late payment, and we all know that late payments leads to um, cash flow problems, um, uh, uh, bankruptcies, granted. But in my opinion, the directive, as it was, uh, as it was, uh, as it is today, um, and this regulation, they are only trying to um, to solve not what is causing late payment, but uh, how should I say? Um, the, the, we, we are tackling um, not the cause of the problem of late payment, but uh, the symptoms of late payment. And we have to tackle the source of late payment. Um, certainly, as, as, uh, as, as uh, the other speakers have said already, this is a one size fits all, which we don't agree um, uh, to have a one size fits all regulation having a regulation may help may help in cross border business to business and business to government uh, transactions okay granted but there again uh, as the other speakers have said um, there are certain issues which we need to uh, address as well we are very positive uh, that the european commission is aware of the late payment problem um and also, we are very positive and uh, and uh, thankful about suggesting training to the employees. So we are all in favor of that. Where we are not in favor and we are totally against and strongly against is the freedom of contract. And I try to give you some practical examples why, if you, if we if we don't have this freedom of contract any longer, the business community will suffer, especially SMEs that we are trying to protect. Because SMEs can be buyers as well. For example, the agricultural industry. We're talking about the 30 days um, credit terms. No, we cannot exceed 30 days credit terms. For heaven's sake, we cannot put everyone in, in in the same in the same scenario, there are certain industries like the agriculture, like like like, like the, the hospitality industry as well. There are certain products with a longer with a longer um, uh, business cycle, which needs more than 30 days. Let's take the hospitality industry. There are certain products which are perishables. 30 days would suffice, no problem about that. But there are certain products with longer, much longer business cycles, for example, catering equipment, for example, um, wines and spirits, that they need more than 30 days. I will ask a question for you all. Why do you grant credit? Why do you grant credit? We grant credit so that our customers will have enough time to sell that product to the end consumer. Okay, so we are allowing, we are investing rather, we are investing in our clients, okay? We are providing them with our products so that they will have enough time to add value to that product if we're talking about manufacturing um, or if we're talking about uh, the hospitality, the hospitality industry, for example, to allow them to sell our products to the end, to the end customer. So, some products like perishables 
probably they don't even need 30 days because a perishable, you know, I don't know, uh, food, for example, um, it's enough if you give them seven days, if you give them 15 days credit. But what about the other products with a longer, with a longer um, uh, business cycle? So that is uh, number one. Um, we have to, I think, uh, Tonio have referred to this, has referred to this uh, already. What about the operational cost that this regulation will, 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 will bring to the business community, especially to the SMEs? Because I'm very worried about the SMEs. Remember, here in Malta, 98% are all SMEs. We can um, start concluding, Joseph, please. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, delayed payment fees, the 50 from 40 going to 50 to 50 euro. Um, first of all, 50 euro, in my opinion, is too low. That's number one. Number two. Uh, what about the repetitive defaulters? Should there be, should there be um, uh, a higher, a higher uh, late payment fee for for repetitive defaulters? Because the suppliers suffer from repetitive uh, defaulting uh, customers. Um, the retention of title that you mentioned, uh, Daniel. What about services? What can they re uh, retain? If we're talking about about uh, retaining retaining your products until they are fully paid. I'm very skeptical about the enforcement authority as well, but I will leave this to 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 Brian. Um, how will it work? How will it affect both the creditor and the debtor in case of in case of uh, late payment? So these are all issues that we have to keep in mind when it comes to this regulation. Uh, in my opinion, this re very similar to this regulation uh, has been introduced in in, uh, in other countries. Uh, Chile is coming to mind. Um, very similar to this regulation, uh, but unfortunately, it never worked. And in my opinion, this regulation will not work. Uh, the European Union probably have uh, where did some research about what's going on in France. France is the only member state in the European Union um, that tried to uh, adhere to uh, the, the, the late payment uh, directive. Um, I had a word last week with our counterparts in France. Um, they have an authority uh, there as well, but in actual fact, did they improve late payments? And the answer is, no. Thank you very much, Daniel. I hope I was of some uh, of some help to shed some light about the uh, problems that we will face with this regulation. Um, especially, especially, I'm very much concerned about the SMEs themselves, which this regulation is trying to actually protect. Thank you very much, Joseph, and also for those uh, practical examples to understand what what will happen in, in in certain in certain sectors. Before going to Brian, I'm going to address some of the comments or questions, not all, because there there are uh, quite a few, and and then we'll continue after. So just to answer Mary Gerty, uh, who asked about the reasoning behind the regulation, I think we've explained already. Uh, however, uh, to your question about uh, government to business it will also go down from 60 to 30 days. So that will be the payment term also for government to business. Uh, we have a comment from Mario Falzon. I think that creditors should be free to set their own terms. So as we discussed about the freedom of contract, however, there should be an authority that intervenes when there are late payments, which avoid court action and dispute must be settled within a reasonable time. And he suggests 15 days. We have Mark Camilleri who said that he agrees that there would be a standard for 30 days, but uh, that the seller may give the buyer a longer payment. Term. So I think you would agree that from six it goes down to 30 as a de facto, but there would still be the freedom of contract. He says that there needs to be a change of mentality because the cost of chasing a buyer for payments is often underlooked. There's a question of whether the 30-day regulation will stop companies from 
requesting um, shorter payment terms. No. So the what the regulation will require is not to be able to go beyond. As far as I as far as I understand. Yes, I, yes, if, yes. if I'm incorrect, please correct me. Yeah. Um, we'll go on to further comments after Brian Greenwas intervention. Brian, um, Brian, well, Brian Green was a senior manager at the Ministry of the Economy and Enterprise. Uh, Brian, uh, we, we invited you today to tell us your reactions after what you've heard uh, from the business stakeholders, because after all, this is a regulation which will impact essentially business uh, of all sizes and, of, and from all sectors. And uh, also, perhaps you can shed some light as to discussions at European level, whether in other countries they are mirroring the same reactions that you've heard so far from multi stakeholders. Um, so thanks for inviting uh, for inviting our ministry for this um, interesting uh, webinar. <clears throat> we are um, already in contact with the business community. We had also an enterprise consultative council on this topic. And we are constant um, um, meeting and speaking with, uh, with yourself here. And so we know the, the view of the business community in Malta. <clears throat> um, we support the need to uh, improve the, the payment periods and to make them as short as possible. Um, however, um, we have to make a distinction between long payments and, and, and late payments. Basically, um, what we we heard here, we are in, our position is in accordance with this um, direction. We think that um, a regulation is not the right choice for uh, as a legal instrument. Um, we would have preferred a, a stronger directive. Um, one size fits all. Um, it, it cannot cannot work. We have a difference and. Um, business environment, so we have to make um, the best out of our situation, of our situation. <clears throat> For us, in our negotiations, um, the right of a uh, field of contract is, is very important. It's crucial for us. So we are working hard on that aspect. And, uh, and also, uh, most of the other countries in the in EU are uh, of the, of this um, thought as well. They, everyone wants to keep the freedom of contract. Um, as you explained earlier, the, um, different um, economic aspects require different solutions, so we cannot put everyone in, in the same um, bag. Um, with respect to the enforcing authority, um, we are <clears throat> working towards, um, this is still a work in progress, so there is no and um, nothing decided as yet. Um, however, we will make sure that it has to be something that each member state um, decide what is right for, 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 for his country. We cannot um, accept um, that um, what we, um, we cannot be forced what to do with, with, with the contract, with the enforcing authority. Thank you so much, Brian, for sharing the views from uh, the Maltese government side. We are uh, obviously pleased that the government takes the position that business stakeholders are are uh, suggesting because ultimately it's 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 businesses that will be impacted by this. Um, that completes the list of of our guest speakers. I will go through some of the other comments which I I, I have not addressed, and uh, perhaps this you know the speakers feel free to jump in if you may have any further comments. Um, we have a comment from Tracy Westell who asked whether there are plans to incorporate similar use of the prompt payment code which apparently exists in the UK. Uh, Josef, uh, did you have? Yes, uh, any... yes. Uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, to, to answer one, uh, one question. When it comes to business to government, it's already 30 days, except for those entities with commercial interest uh, for those for the and 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 medical for those uh, entities, government entities. Um, uh, the maximum credit term uh, is 60 days. This is the directive as it is today. As uh, regards the prompt payment code in the UK, there again, 
uh, our counterparts, the CIC, uh, CICM, um, used to take care of uh, the prompt payment code. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was not that effective. However, as we speak, there are more than thousand, than one thousand uh, companies um, uh, uh, who are listed on the prompt payment code. The prompt payment code, for those who are not familiar with it, is a list of companies which uh, they um, they at, they are saying that look, if we trade with us, we are paying on time. This list is being revised every so often, um, and it's a literally it's a, it's it's a name and shame it's a name and shame list. I do agree with having a name and shame list of those um, companies which are which which they don't pay on time, uh, and uh, another list like the prompt payment code um, uh, of those companies which are committed to pay on time. Uh, the prompt payment code in the UK consists of the large uh, companies, basically. Yeah, but just so yes, I do agree with that. But just to be clear, this is not part of the Commission's. No, 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 no. So no, it's just no, uh, no. it exists in the UK. I, yes. I'm, I mean, for However, those that think... Daniel, if mm -hmm. I may, if I may, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, in the directive, in the former directive of 2011, uh, there, there was a reference a very vague reference to to the prompt payment uh, to a prompt payment list or a prompt payment code call it whatever you like and not to go you know to 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 be too technical but um i am aware that in the european parliament where currently meps are putting in amendments this or s s uh, similar systems have been suggested but it's uh, nowhere uh, yet close to uh, having it as part of the system so based on what we're discussing today this is not this is not on the table we have a question from andre pizzuto who um, i think seems to be from the construction industry and says that the sector operates with sizable, sizable deposits of up to 30 percent and whether deposits offset late payments or will contract terms apply? So deposits will not offset late payments. A contract could have, let's say, schedules, but the schedules will need to respect their own payment terms. So if a contract required a deposit, that would have been paid. But then for the rest, um, the parties would agree on 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 the schedules. But those schedules will have a thirty payment, a thirty day payment maximum term, if I understand correctly. So that uh, are a few more comments. I'll address some other uh, comments which I have still not uh, referred to uh, long because there's there's so many that uh, I will need to get into. So there's a comment from Lena Whitaker who makes reference to the European Parliament and we're going to get into that very soon. Uh, there up until now we are aware that there's supposed to be a vote on the 22nd February even though as far as I knew until Friday the compromise amendments have not you know, being agreed to. Things might have changed till Monday morning. We'll we'll find out. And there were there were some ideas being floated as part of the European Parliament discussions that, uh, for example, um, the, the the regulation would be for thirty days, but there would be uh, certain exemptions for uh, transactions involving larger enterprises and SMEs. To my knowledge. Uh, that was under discussion, but had not yet made it to the final uh, compromise amendments. Although now I will invite the next speaker who I've seen in the list, uh, who may know a little bit more on, on this. Uh, we have a comment from Andrew Mifsud. Why late payment regulations aim to protect smaller businesses from cash flow problems caused by the late payments from larger clients? There's a risk that stricter regulations could lead to unintended consequences, such as larger businesses being reluctant to engage with smaller suppliers due to increased administrative burdens or perceived risks of non-compliance. Thank you for that comment. So, in fact, and maybe we'll we'll conclude with with this upcoming uh, intervention. I, I've seen in 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 the participants list Giacomo Fersini, who is a colleague of mine from Euro Chambers, uh, the, the Malta Chamber is in fact a member of, of Euro Chambers and uh, uh, we, we have discussed this topic several times. Jaco, I know that you're following the European Parliament process very closely, so maybe given the, the questions that, that there were there, you, could, you, you know something more that uh, uh, you can share with us. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and uh, thanks to the Malta Business Bureau for 
this very interesting seminar. Um, as you already said, Daniel, um, the process is now in the hands of the parliament and uh, um, all the comments that I heard today, all the, um, the from the other speakers, they resonate to what we are currently um, witnessing here at the European level. And uh, when it comes to the parliament, indeed, there is um, an, a risk of introducing excessive um, complexity in the in the compared to the current rules. This means, for instance, uh, and that, as it was already mentioned in the comments, the possibility to uh, making necessary for larger companies to pay within the 30 days, so limiting the, the cap the cap of payment in B2B transactions only when the, the debtor is a large company. So this is, for, for in our perspective, this will only introduce unnecessary burdens on companies. And indeed, the, object, the objective of the Commission in the last few months uh, has been the one on increasing the competitiveness of European companies and reducing the, 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 um, the amount of administrative burden. So um, as, your, as, it, as it was already mentioned several times, there is not a one fits all um, um, process. And I would also like to stress the fact that late payment differs a lot across member states and also across sectors. So this is also the reason why the regulation would not be the ideal instrument. Um, also, when it comes to the, to the compromise amendments, I unfortunately haven't uh, seen yet the final one, let's say. And as you said, the, the vote in the committee of the European Parliament will be on the 22nd of February. However, the directions are different and these demonstrate the complexity of the issue. You have uh, some, some um, a side of the Parliament which perhaps would be more in favour of the, of the street cap uh, for companies in order to preserve the position of um, small creditors. Uh, however, the the issue is, is indeed that um, the the um, unintended consequences on small companies, especially, are not well considered when it comes to this 30 days cap. So the the important point for us is to keep the freedom of contract, and therefore this Article 3 should be definitely re reviewed or amended. The direction would be the one of guaranteeing the the flexibility when it comes to business to business transactions, and indeed working on the enforcement the enforcement especially when it comes to large, to to government paying uh, businesses over the 30 days because indeed as it was already mentioned there is a clear cap of 30 days when it comes to g2b transactions however across europe you have member states who pay even in 100 200 300 days and that's it that, that's it definitely not acceptable for businesses so in our opinion, it's, we have to work much more on the G2B transactions in making sure that governments should lead by, by example before imposing such a strict payment terms on, on businesses. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for all the speakers for bringing up all the concerns that of, the, of Malta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo, for your intervention. That uh, brings us to the end of today's session. I'd like to really stick to the one hour mark. Uh, I don't see any new questions, uh, and therefore I hope that we at least answered those that uh, were raised to us during the session. I take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, uh, the president of the Malta Business Bureau, Alison Mitzi, uh, the deputy president of the Malta Chamber, Nick Schwerep, the uh, operations executive from the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association, Tonio Cini, the director general of the Malta Association of Credit Management, Josef Bozotil, and a senior manager from the Ministry of the Economy, Brian Grima, for being with us and sharing your views today. Thank you to all the participants for sticking with us for the past hour. I know everyone is busy and you must have uh, you know, many things to do for the rest of the day. One final thanks goes to my colleagues Gabriel and Ralph, who supported me in the organization of this webinar. We will continue following these developments and uh, communicating with the um, business community on, on where this goes uh, moving forward. But rest assured that we have heard what the views are and we will continue re reiterating these views with our counterparts and the EU legislators in Brussels. With that, I close the session. Thank you all once again and I wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.